Hi, I'm Ed Bacon, the rector of All Saints Church Pasadena. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, I hope that you'll find something here that speaks to you. Welcome. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for being here. I figured we'd have a full house with our brother Peter here. Let me just say a word about him. He, he, he is a director of opera, theater, and film, renowned worldwide for his innovative treatments of classical material from Western and non-Western traditions, for his commitment to exploring the role of performing arts in contemporary society. He's the professor of, in the Department of World Arts and Cultures at UCLA. His past teaching positions include a visiting professorship at the Center for Theater Arts at UC Berkeley BA. Uh, he has a BA from Harvard. And I must say two more things, that when he was a student at Harvard, his production of Antony and Cleopatra was staged in the swimming pool of Harvard's Adams House. As did a subs and, and this brought press attention well beyond it. as did the subsequent techno industrial production of King Lear, which included having a Lincoln Continental on stage. <laughs> Last word from me. I was sitting in the I was about to say audience, but it was a congregation. I was at church in the Disney Music Hall watching his staging of uh, the Gospel According to the Other Mary. And when Mary, one of the Marys, experienced the resurrection as total transformation and enlightenment in her mind before she saw the resurrection of Jesus, I had to preach about that. And that became the centerfold of my Easter sermon. Thank you, my brother, for giving me <laughs> sermon material. It, is, it gives me great pleasure to give to you our friend, Peter Sellers. Hey, good morning, everyone. It is so awesome to be here. Hello. Wow. This is the super high-energy location. Just when you get a little annoyed about the world, come, come to All Saints and just deal with it. Uh, uh, you know, um, first of all, I just want to say, uh, this thing Ed saw, the gospel according to the other Mary. How many people here saw that thing? Oh, my God. Okay, there's some serious people. Okay, great. Okay, for those of you who didn't see it, like the resurrection itself, the legend is pretty good. Uh, and, and, you know, so, so talk to someone who saw it. <laughs> I'll just give you a little quick, quick uh, 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 fingernail of it, and then we can just jump in because I want to get into questions and conversation because I know this is a super hot group, so we're going to go there. Uh, just to say... John Adams called me up one morning and said, I want to write a passion. Now, that is really a shock that a composer right now wants to write another passion. There are some good ones already, like by Johann Sebastian Bach. <laughs> you know, you don't really want to add your name after that on the list. So, and I was actually in Berlin with the Berlin Philharmonic staging the St. Matthew Passion. And that was a really complicated thing because in Germany, this is beyond... It's not just sacred, it's, um, you know, it goes into the sanctimonious place. And, uh, and, and I would say, you know, you're not allowed to touch that. Whereas, of course, my attitude about all of these things, it's like that, that little uh, uh, red box with the glass in it and the hatchet saying, in case of emergency, break glass. You know, it's not to be admired in the vitrine. It is actually to be used. And so, you know, it's not hands off, it's hands on, please, as soon as you have the passion story. You know, it is actually meant to be held, handled, and dealt with, uh, not admired. And that horrified the German musicians in the Berlin Philharmonic. And, 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 and there was a big movement to make sure that the staging was stopped and it wouldn't happen. And it was a very incredible thing because when you do this kind of work, what's so great is the opposition is your best friend. <laughs> All the people who are out to kill you are the people who are going to make this historic. 
right? <laughs> if no one was trying to stop it, then it probably doesn't need to be done. <laughs> so, <laughs> and of course, what was incredible was I, I got the key musicians in the Berlin Philharmonic to memorize their solo parts, which was incredible because they'd always played to music paper and they never played with the part already in their mind and actually looking at the person who they're accompanying. And so it actually was a shocking experience and particularly the flute player who is one of the great flute players, maybe the greatest flute player in the world. And he was very intent that this should not happen. And then we dealt with this. There's a beautiful aria where Pilate says, you know, what has he done? And the answer is nothing. But Jesus, but Bach has an aria in there where a soprano comes and says, well, he gave sight to the blind. You know, he helped the lame to walk. He raised the dead. And this is a beautiful aria for high soprano and flute. And everybody was, just, oh, how beautiful. Oh, how beautiful. It's ravishing, beautiful sound. But that's not what Bach is after like ever. When Bach goes to the flute, it's about breath. And it's about Jesus' last breath. And it's about having difficulty breathing. It's about the quality of those last breaths. It's about the oboe de mora going bong, 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 and creating the heart monitor, which stops four times in the piece, where you think he's gone and then know he's still with us. And in fact, it's the last opposite of pretty. It is the most extreme place of agony, which Bach renders as the highest, most beautiful, most radiant moment. Which as you know, when you're with someone who's passing, this moment, of transition is the deepest moment in our life. And it's completely horrifying. And it's, there is no more beautiful moment. And it comes through a piercing pain, but actually the height of that pain is where it enters the transcendence. And the transcendence doesn't happen unless there's something to transcend. <laughs> so staging these things makes you suddenly have a different image of what's going on musically. When John Adams said he wanted to write a passion, I was shocked. The Bach passion is pretty inspiring because like you guys are way out ahead on the gender questions in these texts, right? Thank you, All Saints. Uh, but, you know, again, it's mostly in a male mode, and Bach is pretty cool about feminizing the passion story. He opens with the chorus, summoning the daughters of Jerusalem, and it, it, he really begins with the daughters, and then he gives Mary Magdalene more arias than anyone else by far, and he makes her experience be how you go through the passion, which is really quite powerful. With John Adams, I, I wanted to go farther. I wanted to make a libretto that was beyond what we have in Bach, and I wanted to find a way through the passion story in the eyes of the women who were at the foot of the cross, who were there on resurrection morning, and who are present in the Gospels, but silent. Everyone who wasn't there talks about it. <laughs> 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 so I thought if they're not saying anything maybe they could sing something <laughs> and we put together uh, I put together a libretto which is uh, from several key sources of course Hildegard of Bingen is always great and clear the how many people know the writer Louise Erdrich? She's a Native American writer. She just won the National Book Award this year. But when she was young, she wrote a series of poems, Baptism of Desire, that are the most terrifying poems of a young woman 
encountering uh, the passion. And uh, she, her Mary Magdalene poem is just plain scary. Uh, uh, her, her big line is, uh, this is how girls get back at their fathers by breaking their bodies on other men. And it goes right into the heart of the abuse. It goes right into the heart of somebody thinking nothing of themselves. It goes right into the heart of the self-destruct mode. It goes right into the heart of where the hurt is and where the healing needs to be. And then uh, Dorothy Day. I'm sure people here are Dorothy Day fans. Uh, should I mention who Dorothy Day is for 10 seconds? Dorothy Day in the 30s, she was a, a kind of a wild, um, very uh, leftist figure who was helping out with the early trade union, union movements at the beginning of the 20th century uh, in Chicago, in New York. She was also Eugene O'Neill's lover in Greenwich Village. She had a kind of amazing life, but none of it was satisfying to her. And she said there's no spiritual energy in that. And so in the 30s, she turned her life around. She started going to church. She tried to learn to pray again, which felt really embarrassing and awkward. And she founded the Catholic Worker Movement with Peter Morin. It's still going very strong. It's here in, in Skid Row in LA today. But she founded the first soup kitchen on the Bowery in New York for homeless people and people needing a meal in the Depression. And there are Catholic worker houses of hospitality all across America. And um, she was a, a really difficult woman because she just held the Pope's feet to the fire and said, you know, Jesus was here not to be with nice people, but he was here to be with the most difficult people, not the decent poor. <laughs> but people who are deranged, people who are violent, people who are scary, and people who are in need. And she, of course, identified that that extremity of need, when somebody is really at an extreme point in their overdose, is the place where you are the closest to salvation. The Absolute proximity to salvation is at the extreme, which is why in the arts, in opera, we deal with people in extreme states. Because when you're not in an extreme state, all you want to do is go shopping. <laughs> which has a limited spiritual power. Uh, <laughs> Satisfying in the short term, perhaps, but perhaps there's some other yearning uh, that's not met with your credit card. So what is it when you don't feel like going shopping? And what is it where nothing feels right? And what is it when your life is at this extreme place? That's the place where change begins. And most of us don't have that moment to decide we have to change everything. Most of us say, well, we'll change this or this tiny other little thing or some other tiny little thing or we won't change anything. We'll just continue feeling bad. What does it mean when you hit the wall and you have no choice but to change everything? There's actually no way of continuing. That's the place of spiritual power. That's the place where the transformative energy is ripe. That's the place where you're falling. You don't know how to catch yourself. You can't catch yourself. And you actually have to suddenly trust and fall into the arms of God. And you have no choice but to trust 100%. There's no way you can say, oh, I can handle this. It has to get to the place where you cannot handle it at all. So Dorothy Day 
publish a newspaper, The Catholic Worker, and a movement. She was here in California marching with Cesar Chavez in the 60s and the early 70s. So we put the march, you know, while, while, when they're arresting Jesus, what happens to all the women who are with him? Uh, that was a pretty great image from the, from the strike in Delano of arresting Cesar Chavez, and meanwhile, uh, all of the women were also arrested. It was like the Martin Luther King filling the, the Birmingham jails. They filled all the jails in the Central Valley with people who were singing, praying. The women's barracks were completely filled with thousands of Mexican migrant laborers on their knees doing rosary cycles. And that power of history, of course, is our history here in California, where we have simply the most despised, discriminated against, and debased workforce in the country, working in the fields in the Central Valley that are feeding the entire country for nothing like a decent wage. And as you know, that taste of your strawberry is just bitter here in California because, well, they're actually those are 90% of the strawberries in the world right now come from California and come from, you know, people who are picking those under the pesticides in degrading conditions and deported if they cause any trouble. And so, you know, that part of the Christ story was really in our neighborhood. And then I also used poetry because I wanted to have against the, against the Bible narrative, poetry gives us this place uh, where images, metaphors open, where you have this open space. One of the things, reasons artists are needed in churches. You know, what Michelangelo does is make something that goes way over the Pope's head. <laughs> uh, you know, doctrine is a genuine problem. Doctrine is the reason people have mass genocide, right? Because somebody says, no, there's a holy trinity. No, there's a... And that means all those people can be slaughtered because you have a doctrinal difference with them, right? The permission for mass murder is doctrine. And we're going to get really picky about doctrine is a sign that the killings are going to begin. And so in all cases, theology needs to be liberated from doctrine, needs to be opened into the place of poetry, into the place of imagery, because those things are actually like God in their nature. They are infinite. Right? What we're dealing with is things that do not reduce. We're dealing with things that expand, multiply, so that we have poetry, we have a rhyme. Right? Two things are not identical. And guess what? They rhyme. Everything in the world is actually connected. Everything has secret inner lives that are vibrating, resonating, that don't reduce, that only expand. So in order to touch the infinite, we need to move into the space that the arts can provide. Music cannot be reduced in meaning. Poem opens, and a single gesture saves a life and has to do with words becoming actions, having to do with putting your body where your belief system is. So we are talking about actually a kind of spirituality that is not in the head. It's not a mind game. It's not an intellectual debate. It is, can you in your own body be everything you believe? Not intermittently, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, uh, let me just show you this. Um, 
That's how you live every day. That's what you believe. <laughs> They're very rarely related. <laughs> and our big work in the arts is just to gradually So that they notice each other. <laughs> oh, that's how I'm living. That's what I believe. And then, of course, all of us spend a lifetime. Right? Gradually. Some days more. until those things touch. What you believe touches every part of your life. What's great about the performing arts is we do that. We actually hire people who are unbelievably gifted to put their body in an extreme place of vulnerability, danger, and generous, generous, generous action. What would it be if every cell in your body was simply offered in the most generous possible way and you're asking for nothing back? That's what the arts are about. All of which is to say we put on stage at Disney Hall a passion according to the other Mary. We call it the other Mary because how many Marys are there in the Bible? Excuse me, 150 billion. Who are, is that one, that one, or that one? Or Let's just put it this way, it's the other one. <laughs> it's not Mary, mother of God, okay? It's just the other one, right? And, and you can decide who that is. Because in the Bible, you know, it's a very basic thing. Uh, it's, uh, my friend Bill Viola, the artist, has a great description of how mythology actually works. Mythology is the form at the DMV that you fill out. <laughs> name, write your own name. <laughs> Location, write where you live. That's where it's happening. That Mary would be you. That Mary's field of influence would be where you live. You just put yourself in there. It's the form waiting for you to fill it out in as much detail as you can in your life. Now, may I just say one more thing? This, this project, it's, we did it at Disney Hall, then we toured Europe with it with the awesome Master Corral. And... People had intense reactions to it because I think one of, these, one of the things we did was deliberately emphasize the social, transformative social energy and crusade against social injustice that was at the heart of Jesus every waking day. The political intensity and daring, the unwillingness to accept old solutions or old excuses, and the insistence right now that things have to be changed for the better. I have this attitude in my own life right now that I can't get depressed because, you know, the government and so on keeps making horrible decision after horrible decision, and I don't want to think of the 60s or 70s as a better time than now, so my rule right now is I'm going to work on things that were never good. It wasn't better in the 60s. It was bad then, too. I'm going to deal, I'm going to remove the nostalgia factor from every second of my life and work on the stuff that actually has still never been solved or dealt with correctly. And that, to me, is very, very, very powerful. So you don't have a kind of lingering sense of regret, but you have just all your energy is reserved for direct action. And 
someone was saying earlier, you know, you can read the newspaper and get a little depressed. My attitude is do not confuse the newspaper or television with life ever. <laughs> they are unrelated. That's a separate category. It's the newspaper or television. It is not life. Life, I don't have to tell people here, but I will just emphasize it. If you're seeing something that's upsetting to you, pick yourself up and go there and be part of it. Do not read about it. Do not, I mean, if you've ever had an article written about you in the newspaper, hello, okay. So, <laughs> that's how much you believe what you read. But also, inevitably, whatever the situation is, go and change it. Help it. Be part of it. Don't read about it. Don't think about it. Don't get depressed. But actually, go and be there. As soon as you're there, you realize, like any crisis, duh, it's there for the healing. It's the transformational moment. So you don't just re retract yourself from it and say, oh my God, how horrifying. You say, how horrifying, how perfect. Because the horrifying situation is the invitation for the transcendence. The healing. The 180 degree turn. The hitting the wall and saying, now we have to do something different another way. And in crisis, we all learn who we are, <laughs> finally, deeply. And we just have to not be afraid of it. We have to go towards it, not away from it. Which, of course, is the power of the crucifixion. Is you don't say, oh, I'm busy next Tuesday, I can't make that court date. You just have to let them hammer the nails right through the palms of your hand. Because obviously, until that happens, there's not going to be a resurrection. And what we need is the resurrection. And we can't skip over the crucifixion part. We actually have to recognize the power and necessity of the crucifixion part and offer ourselves quite fearlessly. In the performance at Disney Hall, one of the things that we did was we had a cast of nine people and they all looked and sounded really different. Some of them were dancers, some of them were singers. They were from all over the place. And nobody ever was Jesus and everyone at all times was Jesus. <laughs> there was nobody on stage who played Jesus. Because again, Jesus is the role that is asking you to step in as the replacement. You're the person who has to step into those footsteps, into those shoes, and walk. And it's a long walk. And those are your shoes. And so one of the things we didn't want to do was put a Jesus who then you said, okay, that role is already filled. <laughs> you had to say, oh, that role's still open, huh? <laughs> Wonder who they're going to get to play Jesus. Some of the audience found it a tiny bit confusing at first, but as you live in it, you start to notice. And you start to notice that, you know, again, Jesus is not here and not there. Infinite, all present, everywhere, in every one of us. The location of all these events, every minute. Every minute is the resurrection morning. 
Every minute our hopes are buried again. Our fondest hopes are put in the grave while you're standing there. I give you three days to turn that around. (laughs) When they bear your fondest hopes all over again, take three days. Go deep. Think it through and prepare the resurrection morning. Three days are necessary not just to react. You know, we all get into this reactive mode, which is what the press is about, which is what the internet is about, is reacting. And as long as you're just reacting all day, someone else is setting your agenda. You actually have to not react because that's just somebody pulling your chain. You have to get into the state where you don't react to every stupid thing that happens. You find your own center of maximum integrity, love, generosity, beauty, plenitude, and joy. And every reaction can come from that. (laughs) But don't get irritable. Don't react to petty stuff. Stay centered. And you set the agenda for your life every day. Don't have everyone around you set it. You create your focus. That's what we do as artists, is just say, no, the focus is here. Because most people are so out of focus and looking everywhere and endlessly distracted. And as you know, That's why they do it. They want you to be distracted because any human being, when they're distracted, loses all their power. Any human being, when they concentrate, becomes powerful. Another word for that would be, hello, prayer. The power is when we concentrate. Deeply, deeply concentrate. There's power. We give up the power when we're not concentrated, when we're not prayerful, when we don't take everything to that way deeper place. Music and art are there to create that meditation, that place where you suddenly have to focus, and it's not obvious on the surface. And I try and make a lot of my shows not obvious on the surface, in fact, not even helpful, in fact, even confusing, so that grazers are discouraged. (laughs) If you think you're going to flip through this, think again. This is going to require your attention because it's not going to be clear until you figure it out. And this actually demands your participation, engagement, focus, and your own best ideas. Because, again, we're not telling you what to think. We're just creating a situation where you have to think. Because if you don't, you have no clue what's going on. So all of which is to say, um, the other thing that we do, do on this is, of course, the passion story has a lot of emotion in it. What do you do with that emotion? What do you do with all the things you're feeling? Emotion is one of the deepest things we've been given, and we just waste it. Please use your emotion. Please store it up. It is a gift. It is the gift that motivates all change, anything difficult, any obstacle, please place your emotion in a focused point right against it. Actually listen to your feelings. Listen deeply to your feelings. We've been through this period where we've neutered our feelings. We've been convinced to neuter our feelings about everything and act like nothing feels like anything. Just remove the Novocaine and feel what you actually feel. That is a very deep message from God. 
And when you feel what you feel, what you're really feeling, taking action is no problem. <laughs> you have more than enough feeling to lift you and take you through what you have to go through. We should open this to questions. <laughs> um, any questions? Um, there's a mic, great. Raise your hand if you uh, have a there's a question right there. I love that. Okay, great. Yes. Coming up. We're streaming, and so that's why we want to get the. Oh, up. great. Fantastic. Streaming is outstanding. <laughs> Let's stream. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Tell me your name. I'm Tiffany. Hi, Tiffany. Hi, Hello. <laughs> Welcome to All Saints. It's great to be here. Welcome. Um, I sort of feel like you already answered this question, but I feel like I need to ask it anyway, and I sort of am not sure how to ask it, and I feel like there's actually three questions within it. So I'm going to do the best I can, <laughs> um, which is you performed the gospel uh, according to the other Mary in Disney Hall. Disney is, and many of the other movie studios are, you know, the promulgators of some really beautiful stories, and they are also the promulgators of the myths that are destroying our country and destroying our world that make women want to have breast implants and plastic surgery and eating disorders and make men take jobs that are against their hearts and harm other families so that they can protect their own. And we talk a lot as great liberals about civil rights and gay rights and all these wonderful things that we've done. And at the same time, the stories are still perpetuating a myth of, of I, I want to say like, capitalistic theology that requires that people segre se segregate one another and someone is always on top and someone is always on the bottom being exploited. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I, I think I'm flowing <laughs> with you. Can I flow right into that? What do we do about the yes, corporate takeover? Yes, let me flow into that. That is so t awesome, Tiffany. Yes. Now, yes. Hello. So, uh, I just mentioned two quick things. First of all, the wrong thing has always been available, no matter, even before television. You know, it's possible to just do the wrong thing at any moment. That's always been right in front of you. So, just to say, I'm starting a new institute at UCLA that is actually focused on this very question, is how do you reverse engineer a Willie Horton ad? That is to say, a story that is deliberately told in a misrepresentative way to deliberately create a false social reality which then creates a voting pattern of a crime wave that never existed and, you know, that these people are beneath, must be thrown away the key, you have to lock them up, throw, all that. Okay, so what I'm going to create at UCLA is a new institute that gathers artists, social activists, and researchers around such things as the drug war, which if you look at from what we would do is use the arts as a place within a university that convenes the entire university. And if we talk about the drug war from every department, from international relations, from public policy, from anthropology, where, you know, taking drugs is a, not a path to destruction, but a path to spiritual liberation and not antisocial, but social. Or the English department, most of English literature is written on drugs. Or... Um, <laughs> Uh, or, or more deeply, the medical departments really get past this two-dimensional image we have of drugs and the drug war and the incredible damage that's been done by the drug war across 50 years. You know, any war that triples the flow of drugs into America across 60 years, who is it a success for and why does it keep going? Okay, we can answer that question with prohibition, which we know the people who are making the money were the cops. Hey, now, put artists together with the researchers, with the activists, and create a new set of images, a new set of songs, a new set of films that reflect reality, reflect what's really going on, reflect the new research, the paradigm shifts that remove the old myths that people are still, you know, going over and over and over again, and create a space where we take a hot button issue 
and you can pick them, and spend a five-year period collaborating across the art forms, across the disciplines, and to create a new body of work that goes out into public space, that becomes the new public face of the University of California, which is not just responsible for educating students, but is responsible for educating the public and actually creating the temper of public discourse, the climate of public discourse, and the content. So we have something that is content-rich. So that is a one proposal. And my attitude is it's urgent, and my attitude is, you know, most artists are just not well-informed, and God knows uh, a lot of people who have public policy on their mind are not artists. And... So what it means to state things beautifully, powerfully, with clarity, but also create an image that does change people's lives, change people's ways of thinking, gives people a new approach to something. We're all living based on images. And many of those images are quite out of date. Could we have another set of images to live by? One of the big projects of the other Mary which I'm very proud of, was to tell the entire passion story not using one commercial image from the history of Christianity. We had no cross. We had not one image you'd actually ever seen before. My question was, how do you do the carrying of the cross and not show the cliched image that we've all seen? So we didn't show it. For me, one of the big questions is how, can, if you really think through something, remove the images that you've previously associated with it and draw the images from a new place. Draw water from another well. Because in the process of rethinking the image, you rethink the content. You get closer to the crucifixion as soon as you get that damn cross out of there. And you actually go into a way deeper place with what's happening. So... Just remove the obstacle of the received image world and find your own image path through your own life. I'll be quick. I don't know if Peter will. <laughs> Okay. Test the question, me. The question, in very brief, is the relationship between spirituality and great art. Oh, yeah. Hey, no problem. Um, <laughs> again, I keep trying to emphasize spirituality is not just nice. I just want to emphasize the bad part of it, the painful part of it, the part that we don't like, is actually super powerful. And that ginger root is really required. You know, that is just too intense, too fierce, too bitter, burns, but also sets your whole being al alive. You know, the great Rumi quote is, the wound is the place the light enters. It's not until you locate the wound that there's going to be any light. And the whole thing about a wound, right, is again, all of us have learned not to feel anything anymore. And the beautiful part of a wound is it's that part of you where if somebody even just touches it, you go, oh, that the lightest touch, you're still sensitive. That place of maximum sensitivity, the place that has not healed, has not closed. You go right there, and that's where the great art is made from right there. It's made from that open wound. It's made from that raw nerve. It's made from that extreme point of sensitivity, and that's where the light enters. Have a beautiful, beautiful Sunday. Yeah.